look how God's decisions and our own are actually used by him to create perfection within within the imperfection that results this is the astonishing thing and we're all having trouble with it I'm no exception how is it that eternity can have free will but we don't sin and of course the larger question of that is how can eternity be perfect when we're all short Romans 3.23 kind of tells you the whole outline of eternity of course that's what the book of Romans is really about how does this all play the grand plan of God from the unbeliever stage in Romans 1 all the way to the completion of everything which is in Romans 8 really and then he goes through the corollaries in Romans 9 etc the grand plan of God how is it possible that God can take, as Paul puts it at the end of Romans 9, this treasure in earthen vessels, meaning Bible doctrine in your soul, and turn it into an eternity that pleases him? And the root answer is, hi, my thinking is in you, it's treasure, and it doesn't matter where the treasure is. Does it matter if the packaging on a Christmas present is pretty or ugly? It's the present inside that matters. The value of a thing, especially when it is valuable, is often hidden in something unattractive so that it will be less likely to be stolen. God has a particular sense of humor about this. He loves putting the high in the low. Or we'd not be here. This really, this is really the big deal with him. Okay, so now let's play this down to where we live because that's an abstract, and we need to get down to where we can actually understand it on a daily basis now. Because what's going to happen ten thousand years from now, or a billion years from now, or whatever eternity starts yesterday tomorrow is going to be the same as now in certain respects because we are the same as now in certain respects you're still you when you die whatever your soul contains that's the real you you have ab absolutely programmed yourself to think in certain patterns you have spent your life, and this is going to be the key to this audio, you have spent your life in certain pursuits. You have been interested in certain things and you kept on following those things. You've been disinterested in other things and you dropped those things. Maybe you picked them up every once in a while. So by the end of your life, you are, as it were, to a certain extent, an expert in your areas of interest. Now, somebody else is going to be a bigger expert than you in those same interests. But, you know, you need a whole lot of people with those interests in common in order to what? Manage. Portray. Promote. Produce those areas of interest. Just like, you know, a car mechanic. I don't have any interest at all. And learning how my car works. My car mechanic is right down the street. God actually caused me to find him. My car broke down right in front of his, his shop. And that's how I knew, okay, this guy's my mechanic. Because I already had three and they didn't work. So that guy's my mechanic. Turns out he's a Christian. Which is really amazing. And when my car needs help... I can call him and he'll have somebody come pick up the car because he's only like a block away. Or I can walk. Or I can drive the car and get it serviced. For life. As long as I live, he's my mechanic. Because I don't intend to move again. Alright, his specialty is car mechanics. Now, are there cars in the millennium? Probably. Are there cars in the eternal state? Well, maybe. I'm getting a very different impression of it now than I used to have. 
I'm getting the impression now that in the eternal state, each one of us, having lived during a certain segment of time in a certain geographical area, will come to represent that time and that geographical area. We'll walk in repositories of knowledge about the time in which we live. So it's kind of like the Renaissance Fair. That's what I'm thinking now. It's like all over the universe, each one of the kingdoms in the universe is going to be peopled, right? And the people in that kingdom are going to represent hope. I'm not quite sure how he's going to do it. Is he going to aggregate us all together by the same time slot? The same geographical slot? I mean, you know, it could be. So people you know in your periphery right now, if you make it to kingship, they're going to be your subjects. And you know them now. And for all you know, you'll make it. Always assume the higher, because that's more difficult. It's always harder to get there than it is to not get there. So talk about assuming the worst. Assume the worst. Assume that you make it to kingship. Everybody around you is going to be one of your subjects if they're saved. That's a likely occurrence. Now, it might not work that way. It might be that some of your subjects are, you know, from like 200 B.C. I don't, I'm not sure how God's going to do it. But if we assume e either one, okay, let's assume the latter just for the sake of argument. If we assume that you're going to have subjects at disparate points in time and at disparate points on the you know, ge geographically, then portions of your subjects are from different times in different parts of the world, and they're going to have that knowledge still in them. And they're going to be, as it were, ambassadors of that time to show how what God wanted for that time and those people at that time could have portrayed. So it would be like having a number of plays or movies about that time to show what God's will was versus what happened. That would be interesting for everybody to watch. And I can imagine that a lot of us are going to be, have some kind of job. And maybe our job is to represent our time. And to sort of like, you know, the little Quaker states or the little Amish states that they have where you go and you visit to see what, what it would have been like to be Amish in this day and age. It might be something like that. You know, like Disneyland or Frontierland or Tomorrowland. You know, or Knott's Berry Farm. I mean, you know, in Germany or France, I'm sure they have similar places. So if you know the names of those kinds of places for you, something that is a place in time that reenacts, you know, like the Civil War reenactment or World War I reenactment or Gettysburg reenactment, that kind of stuff, that's going to be pretty much the main, main occupation for all of us. We are representing our time in space just because we lived through it. So each one of us is going to have a specialty of whatever we did down here. And that's why the kings are the kings, because they ended up having a specialty of learning and living on Bible. That's their specialty. So they become the kings. Everybody else didn't want that. Okay, but God's going to give you a place anyway. And well, what did you want when you were down here? Did you become a fashion plate? Were you like Paris Hilton during your life down here? So what you know are Gucci bags and soirees and all that stuff? Okay, then you can represent that, can't you? It'll have a quite a different meaning in the eternal state versus now. But it's still valid history. It still has a comparison, you know, because it's not like God says, well, I'm not going to allow that at all. But there would have been a sort of, as it were, a, an in-fellowship way to live that life. And as somebody who actually lived that life, you know a lot about it, and you'll know what you should have been versus what you were. So that you can now live both. And testify to both.
and you play it live or you play it as a narrative or you play it as an explanation or you play it as a teaching class. I'm not sure. Maybe all of the above. But that might be your job. To play out that time, that situation, that social status in a life. What it meant, what it could have meant, what God wanted it to mean, and what it did mean. So everybody will be ooing and eyeing over the beneficence of God providing versus what actually happened. It's all Bible class, just like it is now. Because right now I'm making a decision to sit here and record this audio versus something else I could do. Is that decision right? Well, I don't really know. I'm thinking that it's good to talk about this. But I'm not 100% sure. So maybe in my future, when I'm supposed to depict, I might have to talk about how wrong I was to make this audio right now. And I want to say that if it's wrong because it will glorify him as to what was right instead. Not to put myself down. God's not interested in that. He's interested in the glory of the rightness. Okay, so now think about the implications of that. How are you spending your life right now? What about all those around you? We are literally building up our future life down here, like depositing into a bank account. I look back on my life and I think of all the things that I wanted, but this was number one to know him. It really was. It kept on trumping everything else. I didn't really mean it to turn out the way it did. I didn't know it was going to turn out the way it did. But you know what? I have no regrets. I have a lot of problems. And most of them are self-induced. But I got no regrets. I got to know him. So I can die tonight, tomorrow, the next day. And I'm happy with my life. Even with all the things I've done wrong. And there's no getting around those. But look at all the people out there who never got to know him. And they've achieved great things in the eyes of the world. And I'm not trying to say that they're not great things. It's a great and terrific thing to make a billion dollars and, you know, do whatever you do with it. Because however you spend money, it goes to help the poor. There's no way you can spend your money that won't help the poor. It's impossible not to help the poor when you spend your money. Impossible. It's also not possible but that you're helping the poor when you save your money. Because it's one group of poor when you save your money that gets it, or it's another group of poor that gets your money when you spend it. That's why we really don't need government charity at all. Just kill it. You know, there was a de minimis 10% every third year that went to the poor in the old Mosaic Law. So, okay, do that much as a guide for government. So we don't need welfare states at all. Because every dollar you spend is going to help the poor. Doesn't, no matter what you spend it on. You spend it on cocaine, it's going to help the poor. Because it really does. Because cocaine is grown mostly by people who, you know, are, you know, fielding the poppies. They're in Latin America and they're really poor. And that's the only reason they're doing it in the first place. I'm not suggesting you get cocaine. But that's a, a dramatic example. Or you can spend $260,000 on a dress. Okay, who made the dress? Poor people. Rich people don't spend their time sitting around sewing pearls in the dresses. Okay, it's the poor people who do that. And then somebody richer than them finds somebody who will be a buyer for that dress. And the richer person gets a cut for finding the buyer. Because the poor people wouldn't get anything if there wasn't a buyer. And the buyer isn't going to go directly to the poor people. You see the point? Poor people benefit the most. Because they're the most of them. The poor you will always have with you. Okay. Well, the poor in doctrine will always have with us. Some guy who spent his whole life paying attention to, I don't know, being a cartoonist. Which is really a very noble profession. Actually, if you do it right. He could have been a cartoonist and been learning the will of God and the word of God the whole time, too. But what if he didn't? 
Okay, then his specialty is to be a cartoonist absent knowing the Word of God. So, the skills that are involved in being a cartoonist have some kind of parallel universe in the eternal state, and he'll be able to use those skills because that's the way his brain likes to work. I'm not saying that he'll physically be a cartoonist. He might be doing something else, but he'll have the same idea beneath it. Storytelling, with a lot of satire on it. That's what cartoonism really is. Good storytelling with the, with the twinge of satire all around. Okay, that'll be his specialty. He'll be a storyteller. Well, if you were an actor, or a director, or a producer, or a mailman. Now, there's a certain degree to which, if you really were learning and living on Bible, your physical occupation while you were down here will not be what you have in heaven. Specifically, if you learn and live on Bible. Like David was a shepherd and God turned him into a king. But, but God kept saying throughout the Bible about David. He reminded him of it when he was being snotty. I raised you from being a shepherd. And what did David say when he was in fellowship? I'm shepherding people. See, so there is a tie. God will take whatever occupation you specialized in and stayed in. And he'll use that in the eternal state. And you'll be laughing about it the whole time because you'll see the parallels. And yet the occupation you have is so much better. Now I say this because there's a whole bunch of people who are going to die right around you right now when you walk out your door. You see grocery clerks, you see people, you know, at the 7-Eleven, you know, or somebody, you know, hammering, whatever, you know, construction workers. You see people singing at the opera. You see people in the, the hoity-toity stores buying their furs and their jewelry and whatever. You know, they're the socialites of life. They all have a given life with a given experience and a, therefore a given specialty in the class that they're in, in the style, as it were, of lifestyle that they've lived. And that, too, is an occupation. Occupation simply means what you spend your time thinking about and doing. Did you spend your time thinking about and doing Bible? Doesn't mean you got it right. Did you do it at all? Did you do it in the spirit? Or did you do it like on your own, thinking that you were being holy? See, there's two things that come out of that. You have a skill set, a lifestyle, a history, a time period, a geography of your own life. And you're like your own diorama. Go look that word up, because it's an ancient, well, not ancient, but 1950s word. Diorama. D-I-O. R-A-M-A. -A. That's what you are. That's what I am. We're stars of our own movie. And we're going to be called on to play our own movie out for others that come to visit. As a testimony. Here's what I did. Here's what God wanted me to do. And, it, you know, at this time and this time and this time they agreed. And at this time and this time and this time they didn't agree. And, oh, wow, look how good it could have been. And we'll all revel in that. Whatever you did wrong, you're going to actually boast, like Paul does. In Second what was it, Second Corinthians 10? Paul boasts about his weaknesses. We're going to be doing that too. But think about all the people out there now who don't have any doctrine at all. And they're going to die without it, because they think it's not important. But managed somewhere along the line, probably when they were kids or when they were close to dying, somebody was, you know, deployed around them to remind them of the gospel. And they believed. So they're in heaven. Well, it takes a nanosecond to believe that Christ paid for your sins. So they're in heaven. And they got nothing on top of that 
First Corinthians 3, you yourself are saved yet through fire. Oh, there are many achievements all burn up. But God gave them a place in heaven. And they will be boasting about those weaknesses. And boasting about what God's will for them was instead. And boasting about how God, you know, God's plan for that time period that they know a whole lot about because they were there. They're going to be happy. But oh, so low. See, when you come to the end of your life, you realize how worthless this whole horizontal lifestyle is. I don't care if you're rich or poor or well or sick. It's all pointless. Here today, gone tomorrow. Conquer a worm. Beats all. And yeah, you got your memories. whoop de do. But what's it worth? Now, if you got Bible doctrine in your head, you could have had any occupation you want. And there's certain occupations you wouldn't have stayed in, like pimp or prostitute or drunkard. You probably would have gotten out of those occupations at some point. But when you got doctrine at the end, it doesn't matter what you were. It doesn't matter how much you failed. You got to know Christ, so it's all worth it. And you take that with you. I mean, you take your memories with you, too. But, honey, your memories don't count for squat when you're at the end of your life. It's all has been. It's all would have been, could have been, done now, over, pointless, meaningless. And, you know, on your birthday and your death day and certain other important days of your life and the days of the, the achievements that you had, a whole bunch of people maybe will be paying lip service to what you did so they'll feel good about themselves. And that will be bitter. To know that is a bitter taste that just goes beyond words. You worked so hard to achieve so much and all of what you achieved is just going to get lip service from now on. And that only because people think they're supposed to say it. And they might even mean well. whoop to do What's good that is going to do for you? None at all. So if you got doctrine at the end, honey... Then it, you can look back on your life and all the things that you screwed up on and all the things you achieved and realize how pointless it all is and say, ha ha, I got to know him. I got no regrets. And since he can use anything to train you in him, it doesn't matter what your occupation was. You still got it and I'm sure he's going to use it in some, you know, at least analogous manner. But if you come to the end without knowing him, even if saved, the bitterness is unbelievable. This is why a whole lot of Christians, they don't make it to the end. They're still saved, but they don't know that. They stop believing long before they get there. One big illness, one big disaster, one big problem they have, one big failure. And it's like, well, God, where were you? You didn't help me. They don't understand the point at all. A lot of the times, in fact, maybe, well, maybe not all the times, but a lot of them will say, God doesn't help you in a problem. So it goes and crashes and burns. Just so you can realize how it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I lose everything. That's the whole point of the Abraham story. You give up your son. I promised you all these nations of the earth will be blessed through you. And I'm telling you to kill your only son. And as Hebrews 11 explains, thank you dad. Abraham, did, you know, expected it's, well, okay, I'll kill him and God will resurrect him or something. Because he made the promise, so Abraham still believed in the promise. He couldn't understand exactly what would happen, but he was guessing. So as far as he was concerned, and, it, you know, Isaac was no spring chicken. Isaac was at least 20 years old. 
Hebrew word is na'ar, and it means, you know, child of marriageable age. In that verse in Genesis where it says, I and the lad will return, the word lad is na'ar. So it means he's at least 20 years old. Well, Isaac was expecting that too, I guess. They're both reasoning it out. Okay, fine, you go ahead and you kill me, Dad. And God will resurrect me somehow. So Abraham was ready to do it, really was. He still believed God in his promise. Okay, but your average Christian doesn't go that far. You see the difference? You come to the end of your life and it's a failure. And you still want God. That's the Job story, too. You still want God? Huh? You're supposed to, like, curse him and die. But you don't want to do that. Because you know him. So you don't have any regrets about what all your failures are. And yeah, you know, you're going to die on your own cross, ignominious, and it's going to look like nothing. You're going to look like, you know, you know, God abandoned you. You're kind of in good company, aren't you? But it's not going to look, it's not going to look noble. That doesn't mean that if you die peacefully that you were somehow, you know, a bad Christian. But the point is, is that the failures of this life, God allows them to show you how high they don't matter. Didn't matter that the cross was ignominious. So it doesn't matter that your failure is ignominious. Doesn't even matter if it's your fault. I'm God, I made you, and you know that, and you believe in him, and you're still happy. Satan's plan can't do that. So God wraps up the trial. That's the biggest point about this audio, because I haven't talked about it before. God wraps up the trial by integrating the hypocrisy. Which is largely the hypocrisy of paying lip service to morality, the hypocrisy of paying lip service to God, and the actuality of pissing on both. Because, honey, you ain't moral if you don't want to learn the words he wrote in the original words. You're not. God kept these words. He worked so hard to keep these words together without, you know, violating any human frailty. And you don't want to learn them? Then you don't want him. You don't even bother to learn the doctrine rightly? Not that you can get it all right in one day, but are you trying? If not, if you're just sitting there like the Calvinists and Catholics are, oh, see, we're sitting on tradition. We've been right for 1,600 years. No, you haven't. You've been jackasses for that long. But at the end of your life, you'll find that out a little too late then. By contrast, are you really trying to learn the Word of God? Do you want to know? Well, that'll be a success even when it's a failure. See the difference? You're going to die. He's wording all this stuff, weaving all this stuff together into one great big Joel Sherat painting. And if you die without doctrine, you got nothing. You'll be happy when you're dead. You'll be in heaven. You'll be boasting about how wrong you were. You'll be happy to say how wrong you were, actually. I know I will be. So the rest of us. Look at how happy Paul is in 2 Corinthians 10. 12. 12. 2 Corinthians 12. Verses 9 and 10. Boasting in my weakness. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. I learn to say that a lot these days. And you have no regrets. Even when it's your fault. You're boasting in Him. That's the way eternity is going to be. That's why God can afford to let all this crap happen. That's why it's okay to fail. And that's why He lets you fail. When you're weak, then you're strong. Think it over.